Being a school superintendent may be one of the toughest jobs around. You have thousands of bosses and every one of them knows something about education and they are prepared to tell you about it. Our guest today is one of the most respected educational leaders I've ever met. When you mention his name, the response is usually very positive. Let's welcome Mike Berta, the former superintendent of both the Valparaiso schools and the Portage school system to Lakeshore Focus. Glad to have you here, Mike. Good to be here, Keith. Thank you very much. So I didn't embarrass you too much by saying one of the best educational leaders in the region? You did. <laughs> well, but, but, it's, but it's fitting. And you know, I'm, I know I made that comment about you can mention your name and, and it's always a, you know, almost always a positive response because I know no superintendent has, you've got to have at least a few enemies, right? Or a few well, who didn't like what you did. To your point and your comment about having a thousand bosses, uh, <laughs> that's very accurate and you can't please everyone. That's, and that's right. really what it boils down to. You've been an educator for how many years now? I finished 43 years in public education. 43 years. And like most superintendents, you started the track. You were a teacher at one point, and then you kind of moved your way up the line, right? That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, most embarrassing moment in 34 years of being in education? Most embarrassing moment in 43 yeah, years. Yeah, there's got to be at least one. You know, there's a million of them. <laughs> there's a million embarrassing moments. Well, pick, uh, pick one that the audience you think would enjoy hearing. Well, about. I'll, I'll pick one that I shared with the Valparaiso teachers uh, a couple years ago when I assumed the responsibilities there. I, I, and it was while I was an assistant principal at Fagley Middle School in Portage. I believe it was my second year as an administrator. As an assistant principal, you're the hit man. Yeah, that, that's what you do. You are in charge of discipline in the building. So we had approximately 850 students in grades six through nine in the building at that time, and that was my job, maintain law and order in the building. The sheriff, you're the sheriff. I'm the sheriff, the buck <laughs> stops here. With, so a lot of relationships with kids. My office had a room next to it that was used as, let's call it a detention room. When the office started to fill up and uh, I started to have an overflow of kids, I'd sometimes take a student and put them in that room just to isolate them from the other kids or part of their discipline. Uh, so anyway, you get the idea. And this room had two doors in it. One had a door from my office into the room, and then there was another door that left that room. And it, it wasn't a closet, it was a bigger room. And we used it as a, a bookstore also, where kids would come in, buy tablets and so on. Well, at any rate, most embarrassing moment, I had a guy, let's call him Alan, uh, he had done something in the building, and I had a hundred other things going on. I said, Alan, in there. You go in there until I'm ready to deal with you. And this was probably at lunch hour, right, right around noon. So he goes in. Uh, I forget him. I forgot that he was in there. Bell rings at 3 o'clock that afternoon. I'm, get, I'm at my desk in my room getting ready to go out for bus duty. And I hear a knock on the door, and it dawned on me, it's Alan. He's in the room. I said, yes. He said, Mr. Berla, can I go home? I said, yes, you can go home, Alan, but you'll be back here first thing tomorrow morning, and we'll finish the business that I have to deal with you before you go back to the classroom. He says, yes, sir. So I hear the other door open, that second door, and it, it didn't slam, but it closed, and he's gone. So I leave my room, go out for bus duty, came back to my office, sat down, worked until about 4.30, quarter to 5 on some paperwork I had left to do and got up to go into that room to get my jacket. As I opened the door, the door started to fall off of the hinge. It, it, it just collapsed. Scared the heck out of me, and it, you know, it, it took a couple seconds to realize what he had done is he had pulled the pins out of the door and he'd taken off. So I got, I got, I was upset. I got my uh, coat, I looked up his address, got my old Jeep that I had at that time, took off to go to his house. I figured, I'm going to get this guy. But I'm, you, you, this is something you shouldn't do to your assistant principal. As I turned the corner at his block, there he was at the end of the block with four or five other guys in the school. They were all smoking, and the cigarettes started flying because they saw the Jeep coming. And as I pulled up in front of them, they were standing there just as angelic as they could be. I got out of the Jeep, walked over to him, Alan took out of his pocket the three pins there. Are you looking for these, Mr. Berta? That was 
a moment I'll never forget. It was a relationship building moment. I was embarrassed that here's this uh, 13 year old was able to pull this off on me. But to this day, when I see Alan, we talk about that <laughs> incident as well as so many other guys. You know, actually, I thought the story was going to end that you found that he had to go to the bathroom so bad or something and, you know, left a, a memory or something. That would but not have been a good thing. <laughs> that would not have been that would not but, have been but a the good pins thing. Is, the pins is a good one. So on the on the other side of that, has there been a moment for you in your in your history? I know there has been, and again, probably hundreds of them, just where you really felt you really made a difference in a kid's life, you know, or maybe one made really a difference in yours besides the one with the pins. I would like to think, uh, Keith, that uh, what you just said or what you're asking me uh, uh, is very true, that, that I've impacted kids in some way uh, over the course of my career. I know that they've impacted me. Uh, but again, one particular incident uh, comes to mind. I was principal at Kyle Elementary School in Portage. Uh, at that time, we had, uh, the principal was basically the, again, the disciplinarian outside at recess time, take care of lunch duty and so on. I, as principal, I normally ate at my desk. So lunch hours were done. I went, sat down at my desk in my office, I just opened my bag to have a sandwich and there's a knock on the door and it was uh, one of our fifth grade girls. And uh, she said, Mr. Burdick, can I talk to you? And it was a particularly busy lunch hour, and in in my mind was, why does it have to be now? I was hungry. I'll eat you know, my sandwich. Be, yeah, <laughs> I'd like to eat. And I said, okay, come on in. She came in, and I could see on her face that there was something dramatically wrong. Long story short, she proceeded to tell me that she wanted me to know that there was something not right at home, and it took an inordinate amount of time to have her tell me that there were uh, uh, sexual situations going on in a home that were bothering her tremendously and they were starting to uh, impact her very negatively. That's gotta be a tough for a fifth grade girl yeah. to tell a male authority figure that. No question about it. And, and I didn't think of that th at that moment. However, uh, this was probably 20, 25 years ago. As I sit here and tell you this now and, and share that story, you can see in response to your question about a student impacting me, I'll never forget that. And by the way, by 3.30 that afternoon, uh, Child Protective Services had been involved, the Portage Police were involved, uh, all the correct actions were taken. Uh, but you know what's uh, terrific about that story is the fact that, you know, that that young woman, that young girl, had the the confidence or the trust or the comfort to come to you and be able to say that, and that speaks about your character. Because if she was really afraid or didn't trust you, kids won't come to you with that kind of stuff. And that to know that she did says something strongly positive about you. And the, and the learning experience for me was, whenever a student wanted my time or my attention, I learned I need to give it to them. Uh, everything else can, can wait because you never know what they're going to say. You never want to know what's going to come from that. That's, that's a huge lesson. One of the things that I've heard you say just time and time again, Mike, is it's all about the kids. There's so many issues going on in education right now. It has been for forever, but these last, what, five, six years seem to be pretty intense, pretty bloody, whatever. But I've heard you over and over, you'll, you, you'll just almost pound your fist and say, this is about the kids and nothing else. What are you trying to tell us? Just exactly that. Uh, I think we've lost sight uh, in, in many situations of what education is all about. And it is all about children. Uh, there are many kids that walk into our schools every day that have no other advocates other than us. They look to us uh, as public educators, as teachers, administrators, aides, bus drivers, and so on. They look to us to do the right things for them. On the other hand, uh, you just alluded to it, there are actions that are taken that I have a hard time understanding what relationship this has to the betterment of, of kids. Uh, Why are we spending so much time on this, right? And detracting from 
uh, what we ought to be doing in terms of taking care of kids. So I, I have professed that my whole career, and I mean it. I, I mean that sincerely, and yeah, I think sometimes uh, I have almost beat my fist on the table to say, what does this have to do with kids? What does this have to do with educating those thousands of children that parents are sending to us to take care of every day? Right. Uh, you know, I mean, for, for again, the audience who may, may not know, know you, you were in the Portage school system for how many years? And you were also in Maryville schools. I, I was. Uh, I was a teacher, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent in Portage, Portage Township Schools uh, for, what was it, 25 years. Uh, I took the position of associate superintendent in Maryville Schools. Uh, I spent seven years in Maryville and then went back to uh, Portage as superintendent. And you were there for how many years as superintendent? Uh, eight. And then in my introduction, I said, you know, uh, old superintendents uh, retire, but they don't go away. But for you, you left that superintendent position, then you went to the Valpo schools for another couple of years. That's correct. So you didn't retire the first time. Is this time going to really be a retirement? Yes, it is. You sure? That's my intention. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. And it was the intention in Portage, too, Keith. I... Uh, I really intended to retire until the Valparaiso situation came up uh, and I had spoken with the board in Valpo. Uh, they, they, the school corporation, were in dire need of central office administration. Uh, there was nobody left. So to be honest with you, I saw it as a, another opportunity as well as a challenge and I really felt that maybe I can contribute to getting them back to where they needed to be. Well, and that's one of those great examples of where there was, it was a strategic move in some ways for the Valpo schools. They just need somebody to come in and kind of stabilize some things for a couple of years and said, I think that's what they said to you, right? Can you that's come correct. in and help us for a couple of years? That was the goal. So what, what did they see in you, you think, that made them want to bring somebody like, like you in there and say, I think you can come in and stabilize this? Well, I think uh, one uh, element that they saw on me, I, I believe, is what we talked about a few moments ago, and that is it is all about kids. Uh, I think the school corporation, uh, in many ways, because of the problems they were experiencing, uh, were being diverted from uh, the emphasis on students and what we're there to do. We're there to take care of kids. So there's a continues to still be a lot of criticism, particularly of public education, but just generally education K through, through 12. I mean, just a lot of people seem to say, man, the system is broken, there's just too many problems, the teachers are doing a lousy job. You know, I mean, just how much of that is really merited and how much of it, how much of it is just, we're over the edge with it or something? Well, uh, a couple comments about that, Keith, uh, and I think you know this, and hopefully I'll, I'll convey this to our audience. Uh, I am a huge systems thinker. I think in terms of the, the system working together. Uh, as an example, in Portage, in Maryville, and Valparaiso, support staff such as bus drivers and food service employees or the maintenance employees have said to me, what when you talk about systems, what can we possibly have to do with improving the system for kids? And my answer is, you may not be in that classroom every day as the teacher is or as the instructional assistant is, but neither am I. I'm not in that classroom mm -hmm. every day. But what you do has a direct impact on the teacher's ability to conduct a meaningful teaching and learning experience. Making sure that, as a bus driver as an example, you being one of the first adults that that child sees uh, on a day, that you smile at them and greet them and tell them good morning and make sure that you're building a relationship with them and so they, they the students, understand that you care. Yeah. But some of the people see that that system is broken. I mean, what parts of it are broken or it, is it really broken? And if so, what parts? Well, back to that system thinking, yes, in many uh, situations, I believe the system is broken. It becomes so fragmented that all the best efforts and all the hard work of uh, the isolated parts of the system, because they're not working together, the system isn't optimizing. The system is failing to provide an optimal learning experience so for kids. So why is that? Is it because it's too big or people don't understand their roles or? 
Yeah, I, I don't think because it's too big, it doesn't matter whether you're a U.S. Steel Corporation or you're the Valpo schools or the Portage Township schools or the hook and ladder company on Route 6. No system's too big or too small. Uh, it, it, a lot of it has to do with understanding how systems work, relationships, some basic psychology of uh, what people expect in terms of knowing what their jobs are, uh, collaboration as opposed to uh, competition. I think is a huge factor in a uh, system optimizing. So understanding uh, the, the work of a system or, or how it's designed and the alignment of it and then providing the leadership for the system to be aligned is critical for the system to, to do what it's designed to do. So, so if the system worked a little bit better, maybe you're significantly better, that's, that's huge. You'll also hear criticism oftentimes of the teachers, you know, of the teachers aren't doing that good a job. What's your assessment of that? There are teachers that aren't doing a good job, and I think everyone knows who they are. And why don't you get but rid of them? In, in my experience, we have. Uh, there are teachers who do an outstanding job. There are administrators who aren't doing their job. Uh, there are pharmacists that don't do their job, you know, and on and on. The, the, you get the idea. Sure. This isn't isolated to teachers. The, the important uh, issue here, though, is once one is identified in not having the skill and talent to do what one is hired to do, uh, it's our job as leaders to provide as much training and professional development as we can. But once the decision's made that uh, this person just doesn't have the skill and talent to do this job, then there needs to be an action taken so that that person's not in that role, that someone with higher skill and talent are. So some of these issues are kind of at the micro level, at the macro level, or let's go up to the state level. We seem to have a huge battle going on between our, our superintendent of education, Glenda Ritz, and our governor in this state that, if nothing else, could just be painted as very unproductive. You got a quick take on this? or? How does it get fixed, or what's the problem here? I think you're uh, out of office, so you can now say something, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, even if I were still back in the office, but yeah, it's a little bit different now. Uh, when I picked up today's uh, local paper and read the editorial this morning about removing politics from uh, educational decision making, uh, my wife said to me, "You could have written this because I." said this for years, in some way, shape, or form, in order for education to optimize in, in Indiana and across the nation, in my opinion, we have to find a way to remove the adult world of politics from the world of teaching and learning. Can, can that be done by the citizens kind of crying out and saying, stop all this, work together? Is I it? think it can. Uh, I, I think, uh, and I've said this many times, and I'll say it here again, when we have a voting turnout of, what, 27% of the eligible voting population or 29%, and that small percentage, I think that's a small percentage, is uh, the percent that elects the folks that are in office, how can that be a, a representation of the population, you know, of people. So yes, I think that uh, a key element of all this is, it, and I believe that people uh, do want the right things to happen. They, they, they do not support this bickering. They'd rather have cooperation and a focus on kids and education. Then they need to come out and, and make that statement. And part of that statement is in the voting box, you know, when you go to the booth and, and cast your ballot for people who would profess to do the right things for kids. So we're down the last few seconds or so, but if you had the power to kind of change one thing and just one real strategic key thing about education, what would you change? I would uh, do what, and I don't know how to do this, but I would remove uh, the, the uh, constant uh, changes that take place in education based on who sits in the uh, political 
power seats uh, at the state level. Uh, using the assessments as an example, we've been through three assessments in the last three years, and uh, it, it, teachers, and I don't blame them, uh, educators tend to close the door and just let me do, do what mm -hmm. I know is the right thing to do. It, it, it's very confusing, and if people don't know what their job is, that's a very bad thing, uh, regardless of education or any other profession. So what's next for Mike Berta? Well, I have sitting uh, around a little bit, but maybe I'll I don't see the, that happening for you. Well, you're not the only one that has said that, and there I have no plan. I have no plan for uh, another job or another position. Uh, I I've been uh, retired for one week. I've done a lot of things around the house, like landscaping that needed to be done, and uh, changing the oil in the small engines in the garage and those kind of things. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed 43 years of working with the teachers and educators I have, the kids and so on. So we'll, we'll see, but see I have you. no plan. All right, so we'll be watching for that, Mike. Okay, Thanks for coming Keith. on today, appreciate You're it. You're welcome, thank you, Keith. Okay. It's a pleasure. So much is changing in education today, and most of us are just lost in the issues. We should want every single child to have a fruitful and productive educational experience. Research tells us time and time again that educational attainment directly correlates to higher incomes, healthier lifestyles, improved living conditions, stronger communities, and productive citizens. Oppositely, lack of education is linked to criminal activity, poor health, unemployment, poverty, and so many more negatives. There is a battle raging nationwide and in the state of Indiana. Some say our public education system is failing. Others contend it is still great and improving. The opening line to Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities begins with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I think that phrase describes the current condition of our educational system, particularly in Northwest Indiana. We have some of the best school districts in the state and some of the most challenged. We have some of the best high school graduation rates and the lowest. Bottom line, when we have school districts where nearly all the students complete high school and other districts where only half of the students graduate, we have a huge problem. And even when they graduate, you have those who continue their education with few problems and others who must take remedial instruction or worse, cannot even pass simple testing necessary to become employed. The dimensions to our educational problems are so complex. Do we prepare students for jobs and careers, or do we provide a broad general education? Do we teach so students can pass the standardized test, or do we test to see if students have really learned what they needed? Should a free market dictate how schools are funded, or must we support a strong public system? So many questions, so many points of view. Let's begin with by educating ourselves about the issues. We are quick to take a side, yet we do not know what we're supporting or fighting against. We should read and listen before we begin to discuss. We should discuss before we begin to debate. Our school boards, legislators, and state officials are making decisions that will impact our systems for years to come. We definitely need to experiment and change. There are places where the system is broken. Let us thoughtfully consider what must be done and where best to spend our tax dollars. This is not about which approach is right or wrong. It is about what works best for our kids. Thanks for the comments and emails that you've been sending. Your thoughts about this program and what is happening in our communities are very important to us at, public, at Lakeshore Public Television. You can reach us through our email address and watch past shows on the website, which is listed on your screen. Join us next week for another Lakeshore Focus. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today.